It's great to see all you hear this snowy wintry day, huh? Winter has come back like a vengeance. I was uh, making this come my first hour. I might as well share it this hour too. Uh, if I were to look at Pastor Ben and myself and rate us on the, the hug scale, 10 being a hugger, one being a non-hugger, Ben's a 10. I'm a one. Now he tells me I'm a three. Nah, I'm a one. At any rate, you ever have one of those weeks where you go, wow, I had it all planned out, just didn't kind of go the way I thought it would go. That's been my week. I uh, got here Monday thinking, I got this message figured out. Uh, we're looking at Amos this morning, um, our third look into uh, the Minor Prophets. And I, I went over the message. I kind of had roughly outlined, and I thought, this is terrible. Uh, this is terribly harsh. If I preach this message, these poor folks will need counseling after the service. So I went right back to scratch on, on Monday and, and really began to... Uh, dive deeply into what, what is God telling us in this uh, Old Testament book of Amos. We're on the third week of our series called Because of His Love, and what we're trying to do is gain major wisdom from the minor prophets. Um, and the book we're looking into this morning then is Amos. Um, and a song came to my mind while I was looking at Amos. It went something like this, you know, a judgment here, a judgment there, here a judgment, there a judgment, everywhere a judgment. You, got, you know the song, right? And old MacDonald. Anyway, um, and I thought, this is really a hard book to preach out of. Why did I ever think I should do this? And uh, God began to work in my spirit. And I think I got some things uh, uh, out of this book that I d wouldn't have had otherwise. It really got me out of my comfort zone. And it's going to get you out of your comfort zone uh, this morning also. Let me begin with a review. Because Amos, like the book of Joel, like the book of Hosea, fits into the big story that God is telling. And last week I gave a little... Uh, illustration of the big story and today I've put that in your note-taking guide for you because several people said what did you say last week so now you have it in your note-taking guide for future reference but the big story of the Bible is this this is a review from last week it begins with paradise uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with God, righteous man dealing with righteous God. It's wonderful. Then onto the scene comes Satan and sin, uh, enter Satan and sin, and that uh, destroys that relationship as man sins. And then sin just takes over all of mankind, and we get to the third a big part of the story, and that's the flood. The judgment of God came on of all people because all were sinning, and so we see this watery judgment. Now, this is the Old Testament still, right? We're in the Old Testament. Then after that, there's an attempt for a one-world government, and God thwarts that attempt by causing confusion and the uh, differentiation of languages. And then from that point on, from the, basically the end of Genesis, uh, all the way through Malachi, God deals in, in, in covenant relationships uh, with us, illustrative of, uh, of how we're going to have to deal with God because of our fallen nature, right? That's the Old Testament. Got it, right? That's like the left hand. Then the New Testament is just a mirror of the Old Testament in reverse order. On the scene comes Jesus Christ. He changes everything. And, and, and now God incarnate has come to his creation, and he establishes the new, better covenant. Amen? And now we have the person of the Holy Spirit living right inside our hearts. And so we can be in covenant with this perfect, wonderful God because of the redemption of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the person of the Holy Spirit. And then we see that as we get near the end of the age that once again man will try to form a one world government and that will lead us right into uh, the, a judgment again in the New Testament. Only this judgment is not a watery judgment. This is a judgment of fire refining. Then exit Satan and sin and we're back to what? Paradise. All right? So that's left hand, right hand, and then there's a picture. Now, Amos, like Joel, like Hosea, fits into this storyline. And Amos is highlighting for us judgment and some of the aspects of judgment. It's not a happy topic matter. It's not like, let's sit down and talk about God's judgment. Amen? You know, you don't just say, hey, you know, I want to I introduce you to Jesus. Let's talk about judgment. You know what I mean? It's just not the way that you normally would do it. But boy, I tell you, you, you need to understand cause and effect. Cause and effect. And Amos is a wonderful book at getting after that insight. Now, he prophesied in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and King Jeroboam of Israel, about 755 B.C. Um, he was a contemporary then to the prophet Joel. And Joel was called to prophesy to the little nation of Judah. Amos was called to prophesy to the 
northern kingdom of Israel. Interestingly enough, Amos was a farmer by vocation, and he farmed in Judah, but he was called by God to prophesy in Israel. That's kind of like someone being called out of Mexico or Canada to come prophesy in the United States that God's going to bring judgment. How would that make you feel? You'd say, go back to Mexico, go back to Canada. And that's kind of the reception that Amos received. Now, Amos, I think if you were to ask him, hey, what's your ministry, Amos? He would have said, I say things that nobody wants to hear. That, that's my ministry. I say things that nobody wants uh, to hear. And he was, he was called to prophesy during a time of national optimism in Israel. Things are going well. They were prosperous. But underneath that prosperity was some unsettling things happening. There was greed and, and there was um, you know, injustice festering. Um, there was this false sense of security, of self-reliance. There was a growing callousness on the part of the Israelites towards God. There was a growing disregard in general for the ways of God. And, and there was definitely a dullness in understanding, you know, cause and effect. There just was a dullness, spiritually speaking. And so Moses had warned of this very thing happening when Israel exited uh, Egypt, when God delivered Israel from their bondage to Egypt. He said it in, in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6, verses 10 through 12, these words. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So here's our introductory thought to Amos. Falling away from the Lord can happen easily. When times are good, you can forget who God is and your essential need of him in your life. And God says to Amos, Israel's like a basket of ripe fruit. They are just ripe for my judgment because they have turned from my ways. Now, Amos' name means burden bearer. And he bared a burden in his day of, of, of bearing this really tough prophecy to the nation of Israel. Let me give you an overview of, of Amos. This is where I was going to do the message, and I'm not going to do the message anymore, but, but this is why I begin to sing that little ditty, judgment here, judgment there, everywhere, judgment, oh, McDonald. Anyway, chapters 1 and 2 are the pronouncement on eight nations of judgment, including Judah and Israel. Chapters 3 through 6 of Amos are then on three sermons of judgment. Chapters then six through most of nine is on five visions of judgment. Are you getting a theme here? And I thought, what was I thinking trying to preach on this book? This is a tough book. It's all about judgment. And the more and more I looked at the book, though, I began to gain an insight I think that's really valuable for us to, to grab a hold of this morning. What was happening in the days of Amos... And what will happen to us is this. If we don't connect dots very well in our life, if we don't understand cause and effect, we're going we're gonna to come under judgment because of the things that we're doing wrong over here. And so that's a big insight that I, I, I got from Amos. It is wise to understand cause and effect. It's wise to understand cause and effect. This theme, as you'll see this morning, leaps out of the book of Amos. It was about three months ago, Vicki came home in her beloved Camry. She loves that little 1998 Camry. I don't care for it at all. She loves it. And she said to me, it's running really rough and the engine light's flashing. <laughs> I said, oh no. Oh yes. No, anyway, it, it might be on its last leg because I didn't know what was wrong with the, 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 you know, what's going on, but I knew that that's serious. When your engine light flashes, that's serious. Uh, and so I, I kind of debated what to do. I thought, maybe, maybe it's finally de dead. It's 20 years old. And, you know, but I'll do one thing. I'll try one thing. And so we got on Amazon and we bought this little digital analyzer that can plug into your car's plug-in under the dash. If it's a 1996 or newer car, you can analyze what's wrong. So I thought, 
It's $18 on Amazon. And then it was on sale for 12 bucks. I thought, surely something for 12 bucks cannot work. But we bought it. I thought, what risk is there? It's $12, right? So I get this thing. I plug it in. The little light comes on just like it's supposed to. I read the little manual and I go through the scroll and it gives me a code. It says, this is what's wrong with your car, the code. So then I pull out their little fancy manual. I look up the code and it says, cylinder number one misfiring. I said, well, I know something's misfiring in this car because it's running terrible. So I walked out and I pulled off the spark, spark plug wire off cylinder one. I thought, well, if it's truly cylinder one, this one will still run the same, right? So I'm trying to figure out what the cause is to the effect of this car not running really well. I pull off spark plug one, wire one and it doesn't, it doesn't change at all how it runs. I said, oh, that's the problem. Something's wrong with cylinder number one. Now, is it serious or not? So then I walk around out of the car after it's running and look at the wire laying there on top of the engine. It's sparking like crazy out of the side of the wire. It's not supposed to do that. It's just beautiful blue arc about it. I, I was so fun to watch. I went and grabbed Vicky and said, come look at the spark with me. It's not supposed to do that. So $56 for a new plug set and the Camry is resurrected. It's running great. And it was simply because I had a digital analyzer that could get me from cause to effect and get that understanding down. That, my friends, is the book of Amos. It's a manual. It's instruction for us to understand that cause and effect link up in our lives. And we need to understand what's causing some of the effects that we experience in our life. And mainly in in Amos, it's about coming under the wrath or to the judgment of God. What causes that? Amen? And so that's what we're going to talk about for a few moments here in this uh, worship service. I'm just going to drill that theme home to you. Uh, So Amos begins with a pronouncement of judgment on the nation surrounding Judah and Israel, and including Judah and Israel. Um, And it begins with a pronouncement of of judgment on six nations surrounding uh, uh, Israel and Judah. It's like like it spirals in. It's like like Amos walks you around all these judgments and finally lands in on Judah and then Israel. So these six nations are all kind of pronounced uh, in the same way, their judgment on them at least, okay? And it goes something like this. For three sins of whatever the country's name is, Moab or, or uh, you know, whatever, and even four, God says, I will not turn back my wrath. Now that, that terminology of three sins and even four is, is a Hebrew numeric parallelism kind of approach. It signifies that the sins were innumerable, that they were beyond redemption. Let me walk you through the judgments here. I, see if you could see a pattern here, okay? See if you could pick up on the pattern of the judgments uh, of the six nations because they give us the cause that they were going to experience the effect of judgment, okay? So it begins with... Uh, um, Damascus. And, 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 and Amos says, Damascus is coming under God's wrath because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. Next, um, he gets to Gaza. And he says, Gaza came under or is coming under God's wrath because she took captive whole communities. Next, Amos gets to Tyra. He says, Tyra, she is coming under God's wrath because she sold whole communities. Next, he gets to Edom, and he says, Edom is coming under God's wrath because he pursued his brother with the sword, and he had no compassion. And then he gets to Ammon, and he says, Ammon is coming under God's wrath because he ripped open uh, the pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend the boundaries uh, uh, of his borders. And then Moab finally comes under God's wrath because he burned as if to lime the bones of Edom's king. Do you see a pattern here? of why these six nations that are surrounding Judah and Israel were coming under the wrath of God. It was mistreatment of neighbors, of neighboring nations. They had that all in common. So the first example of cause and effect here in the book of Amos, example number one is, uh, I call it the judgment of nations. The nations around Israel came under judgment because of the mistreatment treatment of others. Amen? Are you seeing that? Because you can blow right through this and not see that linkage. It's an important linkage to get. God loves the alien. 
God loves the stranger. God loves the foreigner. And the closer you get to the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the more you get to God's heart, the more you will understand he truly loves others. Amen? And when these nations were doing these horrific acts to their neighbors, God says, that's going to bring me, that, that cause is going to bring you to the effect of my judgment. Now we get to the center of the spiral. We get to Judah and Israel, and they were going to experience the effect of God's judgment for a, a, a different reason. They were led astray by false gods. They had sold the righteous for silver. They had trampled the poor. They had denied justice to the oppressed, and on and on it goes there in, in, in the first couple of chapters of Amos. But here's what was going on. They had been the recipients of God's great deliverance. They had been the recipients of God's special revelation, Yet they discarded that, and they should have known better not to reject the ways of the Lord. So Judah and Israel came under judgment because they rejected the ways of God. In all these eight cases, these eight cases, these folks are not getting cause and effect. They're not understanding this at all. Does that apply to our world today, you think, at all? Think about this. Does it apply to the times we find ourselves in now? Our nation is still mistreating other nations. Is that happening? Yeah. Do we still have vilification of ethnic groups by other ethnic groups? Do we still have that going on? Yeah. Do we have vilification of one another by maybe social classes or economic status? Yeah. Does one generation vilify another generation? Do the young vilify the old and the old vilify the young? Yeah. And do we have complicated issues like immigration? Yeah. But here's what we got to understand in all these issues. God loves people. Right? And we reflect the heart of God when we truly and earnestly love other people and refuse to classify them or vilify them by some kind of a skin color thing or social status, or, you know, heritage, or whatever. We cannot do that. Amen? Because that's a cost, then, for us to come under what? Judgment. I was lamenting here as we were in um, uh, Orlando last weekend, and I was lamenting about the long security lines that you have to go through for everything. Whether it's going to take an airplane flight or going into Disney World, you got to go through all these security checks. It's just annoying. It's intrusive. It's, it's, it's you know, kind of like, I think, a bit humiliating. Everyone's kind of assumed guilty. And I begin to think, you know what? Because of a few terrorists, all this now takes place. And what we can't do as this takes place in our life is to begin to generalize and become haters of large groups of people. This is a very small group of people affecting a lot of us, but they are not representative of their cultures that they come from, and we have got to watch out that we don't succumb to hate and vilification because of some inconveniences. So, so when I look at example one, we have to be careful not to hate other nations and other people. But my greater concern is example number two there of little Judah and, and, and then the northern kingdom of Israel, how they had the special revelation from God and they should have known better, but they didn't, they didn't follow God's ways. And that's my greater concern for us today. I see Christians acting no different than non-Christians. And we should know better the side of the resurrection. We're, no, we're, we're, we're more informed of the big story that God's unfolding, Amen. And we, we are we're filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. And you and I should live so differently because we're controlled and led by the Holy Spirit inside us. And we should be noticeably different in our treatment of others and, and, and our, our understanding of life. So let's move on, okay? That's, that's the first example, example one of the cause and effect of of. of Amos. Let's go on to a second example. Now we're to the section, the, the middle three chapters that talk about the sermonettes, so to speak, on, 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 on uh, judgment. You get to chapter four. It's 
just so apparent that cause and effect uh, in this, uh, you know, discourse that, that Amos shares with us. I'm going to read to you from, from uh, Amos 4, verses 6 to 11. Listen, to, if you can hear the cause and effect here, okay? This is the Lord speaking. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town uh, for water but did not get enough to drink, yet you have not returned to me declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards, destroying them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along uh, uh, with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stint of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You were like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So here's a second example of cause and effect we see in Amos. Now it's talking about kind of life in general, not, not the judgment of nations, but life in general. God was interacting with, uh, in the lives of the people of Israel, but they didn't see it. And they didn't return to him. Do you ever have God interact in your life and just not see it? I think he interacts in our life a lot more um, than we realize at times. And um, I, I, I think... God was trying to get to the heart of these people. He says, I'm doing all these things, yet you're not putting it together. You're not linking life together. You're not getting what I'm doing. So let me give you an example, a personal example. This may help because sometimes we look at this and we think, well, okay, how does this work out in our lives? So we were flying home last week from Orlando on Saturday afternoon, and I'm supposed to preach on Sunday morning. That's not a good setup right there because we have to go through Chicago. I hate Chicago. I hate that airport. Yeah, I've been through that airport a lot of times. I've never had a good experience there yet. And so, at any rate, so we're leaving Orlando at 4.30 in the afternoon, and, and we're supposed to arrive in Sioux Falls at about, uh, I forget, 10 o'clock. And so, it, 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 and so we get to Orlando three hours early, and everything's going good. It's 77 degrees, you guys. It's sunny. At this point, I'm actually feeling relaxed because we've been there for about 12 days. And I'm thinking, life's pretty good here, other than the traffic. I hate the traffic. And so we get to the airport, and I'm not even thinking that there could be a weather problem because it's 77 degrees in Orlando. And I begin to hear some rumblings about the flight being delayed. And I look on my phone, I go, oh, no, it's snowing in Chicago. I hate that place. You know, and we have to fly through Chicago, and I begin to be a little anxious. And then as we get closer to the flight taking off, we get on the flight, and the guy comes over the dreaded PA system, the pilot, and he makes that dreaded announcement. Uh, there will be a 50-minute delay and takeoff as the controllers in Chicago figure things out. And I'm thinking, they never can figure anything out there. And I'm going, 50 minutes, we have an hour and a half layover. Okay, we're still okay, sort of, you know. And so I'm starting to, I don't know, my wife knows my little tics. I'm rubbing my pants, like, but she's not sitting by me, which is probably good. And I'm by myself, and I'm starting to get really anxious. So I begin to do what any good pastor should do. I even thought this, I'm a pastor, I should pray. And so I begin to kind of pray quietly. And God gave me kind of a word right away. He said, Who, by worry, can add a single hour to their life? I said, that's not helping God. You know, (laughs) but I have trouble with anxiousness. I'm going to admit it to you. And I have trouble sometimes losing the peace of God. And so I'm trying to get this peace of God going. And I'm thinking, okay, God, I'm going to rest in you. I'm going to try. What's the worst that could happen? Uh, The flight's will connect. And Pastor Aaron preaches tomorrow. That might not be that bad, actually. You know what I mean? And so I texted him. At that point, I texted him. (laughs) And he's waiting Ah, uh, connections questionable or something like that. At any rate, I was praying, and we're flying, and the whole time I'm kind of praying, okay, God, just let this work out. Just let these airlines do their job for once, you know, kind of like. So we get into the Chicago air- airport 50 minutes late, and we try to taxi up to our gate. Guess what? We can't get to the gate because a plane's being de-iced in our gate. And he goes, there will be a 20-minute delay. I go, oh, no. Another de- Now I'm looking at Vicky and I'm saying, run when you get the chance, run. We're on a plane of about, you know, 250 people and we're in the back seats, of course. So I know that this whole doggone plane has to 
deplane before we get out, which is like 10, 15 minutes. I'm doing the math thinking, we're going to really be close if we even make it at all. And so we get in there 20 minutes. Now I'm thinking, okay, God, I want your peace, but I really want to get off this plane. You know what I mean? And, and we get off and we run. And we did, we did catch the next flight. By the way, we got to wait 50 minutes for it to take off. But we barely made it. But I remember sitting in that plane thinking, what did that anxiousness do for me at all? Nothing good other than mess my body up and actually put me in a bad place. And sometimes God is interacting with us. He's telling me, rest in me, find peace in me, be anxious about nothing, your worry can add not a single hour to your life. And I thought, that didn't help me at all. And that's the message of Amos. God's saying to these people, I've interacted with you. I've spoken to you. I've given you signs, and you're just not getting it. And I want to tell you something. I have a hypothesis for all of us to consider this morning. I think God is interacting with us a lot more than we realize. We're just not listening. And so here's what I want to encourage you. Pray, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Open my eyes and open my ears so that I can see and hear what God's doing so that I can see and hear the ways of Jesus. Begin to pray that way and, and begin to ask God, give me the linkage between some things that are going on in my life that maybe I'm, 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 not, I'm not having peace, maybe I'm angry, or maybe you know, I'm over here struggling with some pain and some history or whatever. And what, what's going on? What's, what's the cause? What do you want to do? What do you want me to understand? And how do I return to you? Begin to pray. Because we live on the other side of the resurrection. We got Jesus Christ. He's died for us and he redeemed us. We got the person of the Holy Spirit to live right inside us. There's no reason for us to walk in this place of being disheveled and being, you know, discontent. And you follow what I'm saying? Does this make sense? Because that's part of the message of the book of Amos. Now, why do you think that Amos was so graphic in his descriptions of all the judgments? Uh, here's my point here. This is a reflection for you to consider. The graphic descriptions of judgment in Amos give a picture of what happens when you don't understand cause and effect. So we need to take this serious because part of the big story of God is judgment. And, and, and Jesus talks about this in Matthew uh, uh, 24. He talks about that, that you know, uh, the big, in the big story that th this judgment's going to come uh, on the world, but most of the world's not going to be prepared for it. And, he, and, and to give us an understanding of that, he goes right back to the very first judgment, the watery judgment, and he says, just like it was in the days of Noah, it'll be in those days. In the days of Noah, people were you know, eating and drinking, they were getting married and being given in marriage, and they had no clue, and then what happened? The flood came. Most of humanity didn't get it. They didn't put cause and effect together. And Jesus says, that's what's going to be like before I return again. Most of humanity is not going to get it. They're going to, you know, not understand. They're going to be like in the days of Noah. And he said, and then it's going to happen. One man in a field will be taken, another left behind. Two gals will be milling, and one will be taken, one will be left behind. And basically, what Amos is doing is preparing you and I to have understanding that God's judgment will come because people aren't connecting the dots, they don't understand cause and effect, and they've gone far from God. But you and I should not be unaware Jesus said in Matthew 25, if you knew when a thief was going to come into your house and break in, you would what? Be ready. You be ready for my return. Amen? And so part of the ministry of a book of Amos is to get us ready for the return of, of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And so when we get to the end of the book of Amos, it ends with this real message of hope, but it takes us to the, the, the day of the Lord, the return of, of Christ, just like Joel's book did here last week. And so there's a hopeful ending to, to Amos. Amos ends on a note of hope. It's only a few verses at the end of chapter 9, but they're super, super important. And verses 11 through 12 tell us in that day, and that day seems to be a reference to the day of the Lord, that time right before uh, the final judgment of God happens. He said, God says, I will restore David's fallen tent, that's Israel. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. And the Bible commentary I read on this said that the remnant uh, of Eden is a reference to the future time when God would deal directly with Gentiles and there would be salvation of the Gentiles. That's people other than the Israelites. This happened, and is happening, you know. We live in this time that Amos foretold. It began to happen in the book of Acts. 
Paul and Barnabas were given the ministry to the Gentiles. And they go to Antioch, and there's a great revival. Lots of people are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so people then come from Judea, um, some helpful people. By the way, you always have these helpful people in your life, don't you? And they come from Judea and say, hey, you know, these Gentiles, they just can't come to God by faith in Jesus Christ. they got to obey the customs and the laws of Moses and be circumcised too. And it begins to cause a big debate in the early church. And so Paul and Barnabas make their way to uh, Jerusalem to talk to the church council there about how they should be treating the Gentiles. And they had some really heated conversation in Acts chapter uh, 15 about this issue uh, of the Gentiles uh, coming to, to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter stands up and gives kind of this passionate talk saying, you know, God who knows the heart shows that he accepted them. He's given them the same Holy Spirit as he gave to us. And we should lay nothing on them other than that they come to God by grace. And then Paul and Barnabas share that there's all these kind of miracles happening. And James, the leader of the church, stands up. And he quotes from a prophet. He says, Prof, the prophet's in agreement with this. Who do you think he quotes from? Amos. And he basically says, the remnant of the Gentiles, the remnant of Eden, are coming to salvation just like foretold. And we live in that time. That time is continuing on to us right now. And so even though Amos is this really difficult book on judgment, it's super insightful because it gives us cause and effect. And that you can look at that from a national level. You can see that going to happen at the end of the age. There's a cause and effect that, you know, the cause is people are rejecting God. The effect is they're going to come under God's wrath. Personally, you can begin to put this cause and effect together. But then you kind of understand that Amos takes us and prepares us both personally and globally and nationally to understand what's going on and so that we can put two and two together. And I just, I look at the book of Amos and I'm going, it's so insightful. So what do we do with the book of Amos here? It should create in you an urgency and sincerity in following God. That's what you do with the book of Amos. You see cause and effect and so you get serious minded about your faith. Nine chapters illuminate us on what judgment is and what's going to happen if we don't follow God. So ask God in your, in your own life. Listen, ask him to open your eyes to see top, and stop your ears to hear what he wants to do. Begin to pray that God would grace you to submit to the leadings and the promptings of the person of the Holy Spirit in you. Secondly, it should stir up an intercessory heart in you to seek the Lord on the behalf of those who do not know him. Our nation is not any different than the nation of Israel in Amos' day. The only thing I think standing between our nation and judgment is people like yourself willing to stand in the gap and pray for our nation. In Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30, God says, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I could not have to destroy it, but I found none. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery angry, anger, uh, bringing on their own heads all they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. You need to begin to become an intercessory. You need to pray for our land. You need to pray for people who are far from God, that their eyes would be open and their ears could hear the message of grace in Jesus Christ. That's why this year, during uh, that vision sharing statement, uh, our, our message on uh, December 30th, I asked you, pray for four people. If you don't pray for those four people, I'm going to ask you this, who will? Amen? Begin to pray. And lastly, remember, we are people who are experiencing the hopeful note that Amos ends on. We are living in that time right now that he predicted in his book. And he saw a day when the remnant of, of Eden, the, the Gentiles, would experience salvation. That's the time we live in right now. And so for us, Romans 15, 13 is, is, is a scripture that really, really kind of puts it all into perspective. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to end there. Um, make your way up here, Kyle, with your, your singers. But I, I'm going to, God has been telling me to share this, but I don't want to share this. I didn't share it first hour, but I'm going to share it with you this hour. It's going to take about a minute, so just bear with me. So in, in my uh, plane flight, I, I was experiencing this anxiousness, and God said, you know, who by worry can add a single hour to your life? And so when I said my week was bad, it's been bad from the beginning to the end, basically. So Wednesday, I went to see a specialist on a um, um, cardiovascular specialist. And so uh, 
At any rate, I'm going to have some surgery. It's not like it's the end of the world. I mean, it's just, I have to go have some surgery this Friday. And I'm in the middle of the story, so they're going to do some surgery on my neck. And uh, I get to be cleaned out. Some friends of mine say, oh, you get to be filleted. I said, I don't like that term, filleted. But it's, uh, it's, it's a surgery they do commonly, but it's still, you know, it's, this, it's unnerving, right, if you have to go through it. And so I don't like to share a lot like that with you, especially when I'm in the middle of the journey, because I, I don't know how to process it yet. But I realized that, that that little plane flight last week when I was really anxious was God saying, there's a greater thing that you're going to have to face here in the next week. And I want you to be anxious over nothing and reside in my peace. And so I've been just saying, God, I don't, I don't want to go through this. Could you just supernaturally heal me? Why not? You know, why not pray like that? But if I do, would you give me a peace that passes understanding? Amen? Because I don't want to go through this. But the alternative is not all that bright. So, you know, uh, I would cover your prayers on Friday morning. And um, I won't be here next Sunday. I plan to just be gone. But Pastor Aaron's going to preach for the next couple weeks. And you won't miss a beat anyway with him. You might be saying, yay, some of you, yay. Anyway, uh, God's good. And so I just want you to know what's going on. But, but you know, I know some people, so many are going through cancer right now, some of you. Some have gone through just amazingly difficult circumstances physically. And some are going through these things relationally. And uh, God uses these things in us to create empathy for one another. And I, I, I just... Be aware and care about those around you and hear their stories and pray for them and be the light of Jesus to them. Amen? That's this intercessory thing. It's, it's we, just, we have got to be in the world, not of the world, but we've got to be in the world and loving on the world through, the, through the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Amen? And so to me, Amos is a great book. I, I begin the week by thinking, what do I do? And I ended the week by saying, thank you, Jesus, that I went through this process of looking at Amos and having to struggle with what does this mean to, to us. Amen? That's kind of how God's word works. So let's pray. And then I took too much time. I'm sorry, Kyle, but we'll just have to deal with it. God's good. God, we love you and praise you. And uh, I, 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 I tell you, Lord Jesus, that it is because of your love that you give us words like Amos. It's just because you love us so much. You want us to put two and two together. It's because you're righteous and you're perfect. But you've made a way for us to step into that perfection and that righteousness because when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, his blood covers over us. And you see us not as we are or were, but we, you see us through the lens of Christ and we become your righteousness, your righteousness, Lord. And then I, I just, you know, and then we can have that perfect fellowship with you. So I pray, Lord God, that, that a book like Amos causes us to, to really understand cause and effect. But Lord, on this side of the resurrection, we know Jesus is our Savior. We know that his blood covers over us. And so I pray for people to really step into that provision today. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us and anoint our lives so that we can, uh, we can just walk in the power. And I, I think, you know what, we need to believe it, receive it, and then live it out. That we truly can be changed in Jesus Christ through the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that that would be who we are here at Grace Point. We love you. And now as we sing this last song, when we sing it to you as a song of faith. In your name, Jesus, amen.